Good morning. My name is Bayad Natwani, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this session on delivering race equality in pharmacy. The issue of uh, equality, not just in pharmacy, but in all aspects of life, has rightly been a hot topic of conversation for the past 18 months. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on BAME persons, including a lot of uh, BAME healthcare workers, together with the murder of George Floyd, has brought into sharp focus the disparities in everyday life persons of BAME origin face. However, today is about how we can deliver race equality in pharmacy. And we shouldn't forget that pharmacy is also part of the wider NHS healthcare system. And the NHS is an integral part of wider society. So of the 1.2 million staff employed in the NHS, around 20% describe themselves as being of BAME background. Analysis of the COVID-19 deaths showed that around two-thirds, around 65% were of BAME origin. So that's a big disparity. So this is the wider context in which it is our ambition to deliver race equality in pharmacy. I think it's also important to have some demographic information about the, the pharmacist register. So if you look at the 2002 uh, census, uh, the census terminology is slightly different to how it's uh, described today, but it's described as being 79% as being white and 21% as being from an ethnic group. The 2019 register shows that 44% of pharmacists describe themselves as being of main background. The 2021 pre-reg exam results there's a really good statistic there. 26% of students or candidates describe themselves as being white British or white other. So there's a huge shift in the demographic of, of the workforce, which has been a continuation for the last 20 years. So how do we ensure that quality is embedded in every part of this journey, from university to graduation, onto the foundation year, subsequent registration, and thereafter a rewarding and fulfilling career path? That's our challenge. Once again, data shows that BAME pharmacists face significant differential attainment gaps and differential career progression, and this has been an ongoing issue for many years. This starts with the attainment gap at university. There's a 12% attainment gap. Uh, the data was published in the PJ, and there's two really good podcasts on the PJ, really worth listening to. Some unis actually had a much bigger attainment gap than 12%. I think one was about 30%. Interestingly, one academic who studies the attainment gap, not just in pharmacy, but across the board, she said that we need to think of this attainment gap not as a student deficit, but as an institution deficit. That's an interesting mindset which we need to think about. So following on from the M Farm, we see a marked attainment gap also in the pre exam. We're all familiar with the statistics which have been published for the last 10 years about the big disparities in the pass rate for pre reg exams. And from the pre-reg exam, we come to the register. You register, you passed all the uni exams, you passed your pre-reg exam, and then you experience a pay gap, an ethnicity pay gap, and barriers to career progression. So these are all sort of processes in, in sequence where you may find stumbling blocks. And hopefully our panel will talk about some of these which are close to the heart. While some of these issues may need regulatory uh, uh, involvement, I think a lot of it falls within the remit of the profession itself. It's within our hands to change the profession. We are the profession. It's up to us to actually make that change happen. So we have a really wonderful panel today, and they'll be sharing some of their thoughts with us, some of the key things which, which drives them and, and motivates them and has led them to be here today. Um, and first of all, it's my pleasure to in introduce Elsie Gomez Campos uh, to share her thoughts with us. Elsie is the founder of the Black Pharmacists Association, and she recently became the first president of the PDA BAME Network. Elsie is also currently a workforce EDI lead in the NHS. Over to you, Elsie. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for coming uh, this morning to listening to us. The brief is to uh, speak for five minutes about two matters that are close to my heart. And to do that, I want to take you through a very brief journey, remind you of two different um, big reports that have been published by the same author. I am talking about the Snowy White Pig by Roger Klein, and recently published uh, last week, No More Tick Boxes. These two articles are talking about the main thing, about we need more representation of BME 
in leadership positions, and we need more opportunities for BME to advance in the career. I am the president of the PDA BME, and this is a network of pharmacists that came together, and what we want to do is to lead the conversation, to lead the conversation that is going to ideally put us in a place where there is no discrimination, where we can talk openly about the issues that are affecting so many pharmacists. If you are in a position like me, where I come to talk to people that look like me, that look like many of you, that are very passionate about doing the job that they really love, but also being not treated that well, being some of them have to leave their career, then you know that we have got a problem. And I want to talk to you about what is that that we need to do to make sure that our leadership looks like our profession, the members of our profession. Because I can tell you one thing that I have learned through my journey as an EDI lead, as a UK Black Pharmacy Association president and the president of the PDA BME. We are better when we are listening to each one of us. We are better when we give opportunity to each one of us. I was doing a focus group um, last week in my place of work because we are bringing new nurses into the, into the trust. And in this focus group, the one that was the, the, the one that resonated the most with me was the one of a group of nurses and healthcare assistants that were diverse. They, were, they didn't worry about bringing new people. They were looking forward to it. And if there is anything that I would like for you to take from this, from my talk today, is like, don't be afraid to open your doors to a wider a range of pharmacies, wherever they come from, how, whatever they look like, because they are going to make your team, they are going to make your organization much better for that. Inclusion, diversity brings innovation. Innovation is good for every single one of us. Innovation is even better for our patients, which are the people that we are looking after. You, if you have got a variety of people, if you have got a variety of thoughts, you are going to become stronger. The other thing that I want to talk to you is about opportunities. It's heartbreaking when you see members of our profession leaving organization, even leaving the pharmacy profession because they cannot advance in their career. I have seen pharmacists that have done MSc. I have seen pharmacists that have gone out of their way to earn new skills, to, to learn the craft that they love so much. They apply for jobs, they don't get it. They apply for opportunities, they don't get it. They see people that are being tapped over the shoulder and being given the opportunities of shadowing and being given the opportunities that you, you know, covering an interim position so later on they become permanent. And what I want is transparency, I want an opportunity for everyone to have those options. And I don't know if I have spoken too much, but um, these, are, these are the two topics that I want to raise here. It's about making sure that you give, you are the leaders of our profession and we rely on you. And it's making sure that everyone in your team that deserves it have the opportunity to advance in the career. It's, uh, it's hard, it's um, frustrating to see people 20 years into the pharmacist career still working at junior positions, moving from, pos from organization to organization because they don't get a <laughs> foot inside the door. And um, I, uh, I don't want to get too emotional or anything like that, but imagine someone that comes to study pharmacy with big hopes. Imagine that you have spent so much time putting them through the diploma, the certificates, educating them, and then 10, 15 years, when they can pass that experience, everything that they have learned, they can pass to the new generation, they are telling you, I am out of here. I am, you know, I am looking into a different profession. I do, not want, I, do not, I do not want to continue working here. And I had a meeting last week with some members of the UK BPA, and I was asking, how, how is everything going? You know, we came out of the lockdown, how is work? And everyone is saying exactly the same thing. Everyone is leaving, we are so short of staff. And why are people leaving? It's because we are not treating them well. So if you are a leader, 
if you are leading your organization, please, please look after your staff. BME bring a huge contribution to your team. You are going to be better for it and give them the opportunity to grow up. We cannot continue seeing this snowy peak of leadership at the top. We want leaders that look like us so the new generation can have an aspiration to get there. Thank you. Thanks, Elsie. That was really passionate, and I think a lot of the audience will share some of those thoughts. Uh, next, we have Raul Singal, who's going to share his thoughts with us today. Raul is currently the chief pharmacist at the NELFT, which is a large community and mental health trust serving the diverse communities of Northeast London. Raul is also involved in several national pharmacy groups, including, including being a member of the RPS Hospital Expert Advisory Group. Raul, over to you. Yeah. Is that any better? Yeah, okay. Um, brilliant. Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Rahul. Um, so I'll just speak for a couple of minutes and then it'll be good to do some questions. So I guess the brief, um, as I understood to, to talk a bit about here today, was think about kind of two factors that um, would kind of have the greatest impact or have an impact in starting to address um, some of what Elsie's talked about around race equality in, in pharmacy. I think from my perspective, um, I guess what, what's been described, I mean, it's almost pharmacy seems like a bit of a microcosm of what I think the NHS might be discussing um, in, and other professional groups might be discussing and, and then I guess probably wider than the NHS and, and, and a more of a societal challenge. Um, so I think what might be helpful is if I, if I talk about it from the framing of, so people will be aware of the pharmacy inclusive plan that, uh, that was published, um, which, is, which is quite a helpful framework. Um, I think the first thing to point out from my perspective is this is an incredibly complex issue. And, and I think the pharmacy inclusive plan makes a very complex issue in some sort of simplistic, gives an opportunity to give it a simplistic framework so we can start to, start to tackle it. But the elements that I'd focus on on that is there's an element around here around leadership positions, which I'll talk about here. Um, and there was a second bit in that plan around, for me, was around health inequalities. So it's almost, um, that's more like the so what. So, so what if we have a diverse workforce that represents the patients? You know, who's, does that mean anything's going to be better? So if I start there, and then I'll talk about the leadership positions, and then, and then I'll close. So... So I guess I've paid more attention to health inequalities over the last few years of my career. I don't think it's been something that's been the forefront of my mind since I've qualified. Um, and I think if I look at my own organization, my own practice, and some of my team are in, in the room, that we've probably got a really fortunate position being a community mental health trust that we work with lots of vulnerable patients. And we're based in... Uh, Barking, Havering, um, Dagnum, which is, you know, where the stats that you're talking about in the register is probably what my department feels like. You know, we are probably about 20% um, white um, and our population is probably about the same. So I'm fairly confident we've got a department or a team in a pharmacy team that reflects our population. And and then, which, which, is, which is quite nice. And, and I, guess, I guess for me, the things that we do with health inequalities or the work that we're doing is where we, where we kind of do a bit more outreach work. So um, Rizwana, that's in my team, here has done some work around doing, seeing learning disability patients in an outreach service. Um, uh, we've got patients that um, engage with our um, SMI patients out in the community, help them with their physical health checks. We're looking at work around ethics disparities between how white males and black males, the difference between the antipsychotic treatments they have, which you know are showing stark differences. And I think we've got a department and a team that are really interested in looking at those issues um, and then feel that they can connect with those patients and those service users in, in a meaningful way to start delivering those outcomes. So I, I think I'm fortunate that I'm working in a department where I can see the benefits of having a diverse workforce, improve patient outcomes in, in those areas. The second point around leadership and around how we probably do more or do better to improve diversity in that space, uh, it's, a really, it's a really difficult really difficult thing, I think. I think my, my kind of advice to people I mentor and, and people I speak to of, of ethnic backgrounds and, and BME and others is there is something here around 
it, it's something that I've done in my own career is you know really value mentorship and coaching and reaching out to people and having peers that you can speak to to understand what you need to do, what the things that you need to do to advance in your career. I completely understand that there is a challenge around people getting tapped on the shoulder for a job or getting nudged or different people face fits um, for different roles. And, and there is, you know, it'd be, I personally don't know if I've experienced it, but I'm, I'm aware of lots of people that have, feel they have experienced that. Um, and there isn't a single solution that would address to anything that we're going to say on stage here or anything that's going to be able to, to, to do that. I think one of the things that I'd encourage all employees to do, chief pharmacists and leaders of every organization, is to think about their recruitment processes and be really clear that there will be bias in all of that. You know, we all have bias. And to us to sit around thinking that we don't have bias is, um, is irresponsible almost. I think we need to think about how we have panels that mitigate that bias. And, and that's something we've paid a lot of attention to in our organization. Um, and really, and really making sure we, we you know we always have an EDI rep on our panel. We try and make sure our panels are represented for all our positions. Um, the organisation requires it from grade eight A and above, um, but we, we try our best to do it in all of that. And I, and I think that starts starts to shift things slightly practically in each organisation. So just making sure that you know if you do have a bias, um, which everyone that's on that interview panel may do, um, it's mitigated by the fact that you've got diversity um, even in that context. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully that's helpful uh, framework. Well, no, I'll, I'll pause there, thanks. Uh, health inequalities, because health inequalities are the manifestation of, of wider inequalities in, in, in society in general, of which pharmacy is a part. So that's really an interesting perspective. Uh, our last speaker uh, is uh, Toidal Islam, Toydell is a community locum pharmacist, and in 2018, he established the Pharmacist Cooperative to help support pharmacists and to help uh, them work together. Toydell recently hosted a really interesting webinar about AI and automation in pharmacy uh, and its potential impact on pharmacy practice. He's also involved in a number of technology startups to develop tech solutions for community pharmacies. Uh, Toydell. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm just going to be a bit awkward and start with a slide. Um, just want to look at these two pictures I'm going to put up first. And this one. Just want you to think about the, what you saw in the first picture and what came to your mind. And when you saw the second group of, picture, of people, what came to your mind. Now, when you ask most people, you show a picture of the first picture, they'll say, oh, it's a man and a woman. Uh, and then when you show them the second picture, it's all oh, uh, a black male, an Asian male, uh, someone wearing a hijab. So then you've got to ask yourself, why is it when you see two white people, you see people? And when you see someone of a different ethnicity, you first notice the color of the skin or how they dress, just something uh, that is, isn't related to uh, what they are. Um, now that's called an unconscious bias, and it's something that Rahul spoke, uh, spoke about before. We all, all have some kind of bias. Uh, but racism is obviously something much more deeper. The definition is uh, prejudice, uh, discrimination, antagonism directed against someone of different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. Now that's a simplified explanation of what racism is. It's a bit more complex. Um, and it's, I mean, there, there's a lot of research done by um, a number of people, including um, a gentleman called Charles Mills. Now, he's a philosopher, and he did a lot of work on the politics of racism. I know a lot of people say racism is quite complex and is deep-rooted, but the gist of it is, if you don't like someone because of the color of their skin, where they come from, or their religious belief, the way they dress, the problem is you. It's a form of narcissism that you fear something that you don't understand. And in 2021, should we really have that kind of a fear? Now, there isn't any biological um, source of race. We are just one human race. Um, according to Charles Mills, the 
whole idea of the race theory came about in the 19th century in Europe to slot people into the different um, parts. So you have the white people at the top, black people at the bottom, and everyone in between. So the race was in a way to slot you into the society where they could be controlled. Say, take South Africa, for example. White people at the top, people of color in the middle, and black people at the bottom. It just controlled the society, so the colonizing uh, population had greater control. Uh, fast forward to 2020 and 2021, where the pandemic has really brought out the cracks in society. You've got a lot of people sitting at home, get on the internet, and they can be anonymous and spew as much racism as possible. And the media really helped that because when you see a lot of the headlines, a lot of the images on, on the media, you'll see Asians or you'll see people wearing a hijab, um, anyone but a white face. Uh, and there's been a lot of research done about that as well in that that kind of pushes the idea that the, they're bringing in or they're the carriers or they're spreading COVID and it's their fault. Uh, you had uh, Donald Trump call it the Chinese virus. So a lot of the uh, Asians had a lot of uh, racial abuse. In America, there's a lot of violence as well. So it really brought out the uh, racism over the past couple of years. Now in pharmacy, um, when we run, we run one of the largest networks online for pharmacy, we have about 10,000 people there. So we see a lot of the issues that come up uh, and how pharmacies get treated. Now, there's a story of one of our colleagues who actually supports our network. She's a mental health pharmacist and she's worked incredibly hard over the past few years to get where she is. But she's faced a lot of hurdles. She faced a lot of racism, uh, very subtle forms of racism. Um, and she's been stopped from getting promotion, promoted. She's been stopped from getting jobs because they said, oh, you won't be able to handle it, it's too difficult. So there's a, and that's now meant that she's leaving the NHS and that's, her job will be now taken by someone who's probably less qualified. The impact of that on the patients is that they'll have a healthcare professional who's probably not as qualified or doesn't have as much knowledge uh, about the topic as my colleague who's leaving. That's a big loss of the NHS. And it's a big loss to the patients as well. So, and that's just one aspect of racism. The other, the other aspect is the impact it has on the people, on, on the BAME population. There's been research to show that racism has a real physiological impact, the stress that it causes, it can lead to heart disease and early death. And there is a lot of research to prove that as well. So racism isn't just a, an idea that, well, you know, there's a bit of history there, we'll try and get rid of it and everyone will be fine. It has a real, real impact. It kills. It doesn't just stop people from getting a promotion or it doesn't just make people depressed. It literally kills early. So we need to get to the bottom of it. We need to try and figure out how do we change the system. Now there's, there's research to show that you can't, well, there are psychologists who say you can't really change a racist person. I mean, no one is born racist, but the society gives you the idea that you are somehow superior to someone who's of a different color or from a different country. Like, but then you gotta ask yourself, what choice did you have to be born in that family, to be born in that country, to be born on that side of the fence? You didn't, no one did. So that doesn't make you a superior person by a long margin. 30 seconds left. So uh, I'm probably going to end it there for now. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Oedel. Uh, sorry to interrupt your, your flow there, but I'm sure we'll come back to it when the questions come from the floor. Uh, now, the most interesting part of, of today, I think it's really the questions, the thoughts which uh, the panel has thrown up in the conversations they've had today. Uh, it's over to you. Any questions? The lady, there's a lady here. Hello. 
Hello, thank you, panel. My name's Sinead Havari and I work for CPP. This is a subject that is very close to my heart. We have acknowledged how complex this issue is. And I ask you, if we all want to make a difference, what is the one thing that we could all start doing to start managing our own unconscious bias or at least raising our awareness of that so that we can start to think about how do we help to contribute to resolving some of these issues? I think that's a really good question because I think it's down to all of us as a profession individually to take responsibility and challenge ourselves and challenge others as well, but challenge ourselves as well. So, panel. See, you want to move this mic up? Just, just bend it up. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, excellent question. Thank you for that. And there is a huge amount of literature out there. There is no, a, it's no, you don't have to look hard. You don't have to look hard for it. So it just start with you taking the initiative, buy one book at a time, read it. Look at the message that is being sent out. Go out to the place where you are working and start looking at yourself and start looking at your bias. Everyone, if you don't have bias, you are not human, you know. And then the next step that you have to do is start questioning. Start questioning. We are all intelligent people and we know when things don't feel right. When things don't feel right. Ask questions why it is that every single member of a staff that is being promoted look like the leader. Ask that question, you know, ask questions why that person have got into a course that we didn't know about it. Why not everyone was, what, was where is the transparency? Why not everyone was told about it? So take the step of start reading. There is a lot of literature and there is a lot of um, definitions that we need to learn. And don't be, um, don't think, oh, I didn't know about that. I am, I am learning. I am now in an EDI position. And every single day, every time that I, I am sent to a webinar, I am learning a new definition, a new concept. And I need to read it. I need to look at it. And I need to, you know, start asking myself what I understood about it. But bottom line, have the courage to do it and have the courage to challenge what you think is not right. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Um, so, so I think my, my view on that now is, um, so, 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 so one of the things that I think we've lost a little bit of, and I've spoken about this with my, my own team, is this, um, I'm not looking at you because the light is <laughs> glaring at me in the eye, so I'm not, um, the, um, uh, is we've probably stopped being so kind and compassionate uh, sometimes. So I think if I speak to some of the people in my team that have asked me the, the questions around race and, race and equality, there is, this, there is a challenge I think we're all facing at the moment, whereas we've stopped inquiring around each other and we've stopped asking questions um, because we are either scared, we don't want to come across stupid, we don't ask questions on you know, who they are. So I was talking to someone in my team, we were doing some a survey really around EDI working out what, uh, what's in our team. And, and then and I remember she saying, she goes, well, they just think everyone blacks from Nigeria, you know, and they just think everyone like with a, where any woman wearing a hijab in our area is Bangladeshi or it's that and the other. And they're like, I have no idea where half these people are from and all the rest of it. And she felt probably quite safe to have that conversation with me. Um, and I asked her, what stops you asking? Um, and it's just fear. It's fear to ask the question. Um, and I, and I, you know, I remember saying to her, try it, just go and ask them, you know, where are you from, tell me about your background, etc. And I'm sure it'll, I'll be interested to hear how this experiment goes. Um, and, and it, it, you know, and we all know it goes, goes fine. If people take a general interest in one another again, and I think we've stopped doing that, then I think some of that unconscious bias that you've talked about, we will start to overcome because we've, we almost learned again. I think we're all sitting with a set and set of assumptions. And I think we're finding it difficult to engage past that because there feels like there's a temperature where everyone's glowing a bit red hot and everyone's a bit sensitive to things at the minute. And, and it's very difficult to have those kind of conversations right now. But me as an individual, the only thing I could probably do if I don't know is ask a question. There's probably, because anything else I do will probably only exacerbate the issue of unconscious bias. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So I think, keep it simple. Keep it really simple. Just 
as uh, Rahul said, just talk to people, um, learn about them. If they're different to you, learn about them, question yourself. I mean, if you have a bias uh, or if you don't know about a certain culture, Google it, really, or, and talk to people or from that culture or from that background and learn about them. I mean, every day is a journey. Um, like I said, none of us really had a choice in where we were going to be born, which time frame, which gender, nothing. None, none of it was a choice. We were born, so this is an age of science where we question it, where there's so much knowledge around. There isn't really any excuse for you not to ask or not to learn about other people. It's very, very easy to do right now. There's a lot of educational programs out there on YouTube. You can learn about different cultures. Um, and the biggest thing that people fear is something that they don't know. So to really resolve it, just keep it simple and just learn. Thanks for the question. That's really interesting replies because, and the gist of what I get from that is that, you know, it's, it's really difficult. It can sometimes be a really difficult conversation, but have the conversation, be it confidently do it confidently do it with a smile and do it with engagement i think that's the real thing because ultimately we're all part of the same profession we're all also part of the same the same society we're all also human beings so you know that empathy will really f come out and it's nice to reach out and share your concerns or your thoughts so i think that's what i took from from the response from the from the panelists uh question there Hello, good morning, panel. My name is Paul Summerfield. I'm from Pharmaceutical Defence. Quite interestingly, Barrett, you mentioned the attainment gap at university, and also, Raoul, it's great to hear that it's an 80-20 split to reflect the community that you're in in your team. Would the panel like to see a more um, EDI training at undergraduate level to try and combat some of the problems we're seeing later on in the profession? That's a great question because the topic of uh, EDI at the starting point of the education process and the government has set a target uh, for 2025 that all educational institutions should uh, remove or be actively uh, attempting to remove the attainment gap which is quite marked not just in pharmacy but across every undergraduate course. So uh, I think that's a real challenge and I think it would be interesting to see the experiences certainly because I think some of you guys actually come across students and train students how what their experiences are. Uh, yeah sure. Um, I thought it was a bit of a leading question. I think the, <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, there is a role but I think all I'd, all I'd add to that is um, I think the challenge would be is uh, employers can't shirk their responsibility from also ensuring that EDI training is happening in their workplace um, because I think the risk could be is physicians like mine could sit back and say, well, they learned how to be EDI aware at uni, didn't they? Um, and, and now that's stopped. So I think there's something about um, the continuum of pharmacy, understanding that from, you know, whatever the top positions are to undergrad, everybody ensuring that there is, there is sufficient you know, awareness training going on throughout that would be, would be my view. Uh, can, I add, can I add something? It's just no EDI training, but EDI monitoring. You know, you can train people from the university, which I think is a huge gap. You know, we have to do that, and we have to continue doing it. We do mandatory training when you first join the trust or when you first join your employment, and there you go. You are, you know, no, 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 monitor it, monitoring it as well. And because there are lots of resources, the PDA have got lots of resources that you can actually use, so it shouldn't be that difficult. The training and the monitoring, both of them go hand by hand. Thanks very much, because I think that's really important because there's so much data about it, the ethnicity pay uh, gap and also the lack of mentorship and career progression. Because if you're frustrated, as Toriadil said, that if you're frustrated in your career, you leave the profession. That's not just a loss to the profession. It's a loss to the wider community because those skills, which are hard work to achieve, are lost. And that's a, that's a loss to wider society as, as a whole. So that's a really interesting question. And thank you for the re replies. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thanks very much to the panel. Really interesting uh, discussions today. Uh, Nick Haddington, Health Education England. Just taking the conversation about education on a little bit further, um, 
you spoke very clearly about the, the differential attainment gap that happens at each stage of the process at the, uh, the M Farm and at the foundation training, and also probably before that in, uh, in kind of initial and, and, uh, and, and secondary education. In terms of addressing those differences and trying to correct them, to what extent do you think that we need to treat everyone equally, or is there a role for trying to address differences and treating people fairly based on their background in order to close that attainment gap? I think that's a really interesting and a really challenging question because I think the perception quite often can be that do we want equality of opportunity or do you want to favor positive discrimination in inverted commas? I think that's a really interesting concept. And I think that's a really challenging concept because it's some, something which comes back as, oh, someone shouldn't be there because of their ethnicity. I think that would be the wrong thing. I think most of us feel that. And it'd be interesting to hear the panel's view on how that can be addressed. Do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, so you can hear me. Yeah. Um, I think the, the ideal situation would be meritocracy. Uh, and ensure that people who have the right merit and the right skill come through. But that's quite difficult to do, uh, especially if, you, if you're in an environment which is designed not to let you through. Um, so we need to work on a system which is fair and unbiased. So how do you develop that system? How do you get rid of human bias? Um, and that's where I think EDI training comes in. That's where panels come in where you ensure that people with the right skills and the right grades pass through. I mean, one of the interesting things that we were doing in, on the Farms Cooperative, we started working with an agency for recruitment for the NHS. And one of the key things that I wanted to look at was how do we get rid of bias at the selection process? So with a lot, when you send in CVs, obviously you have your name, and from the name you can tell that they're not English. Um, so what we did was we anonymized the full CV. We got rid of the name, any personal details, apart from the educational work experience, we got rid of everything else. Um, and the NHS were only able to pick the CV based on the merit and the skills and what they needed. And after that, well, this is who it is, this is who it is. And that really, I think, helped us make sure the team was diverse. Um, now, how would you do that in an educational institution? I think that's a bit more tricky. Um, and that's something we really need to work on uh, as a society and uh, as a profession. I think we need to move from equality to equity because um, not everyone has got the same needs. You know, there are, we, we know BME staff, some of them have got family while they are studying. So other students that are not BME, they may have everything, you know, uh, all, all sort of opportunities. So it's not just about treating everyone equally, but treating people according to the needs. So that is why mentorship is important, is, is crucial. And we get lots of uh, requests, people asking for mentor. And it's not just mentorship, but perhaps mentor that meets the needs of the people. We usually get mentors of people, they want people that look like them that have lived you know, the experiences that can relate more closely. So it's a responsibility of people like you to, you know, to realize that not everyone is equal. You know, we are not equal. We have got different needs. How are you going to meet those needs? It's not about, okay, there is a mentorship, go for it. No, is this mentorship right for you? You know, is this person the person that you need to lead you through your career? Because a mentor, you can be with a mentor for a long period of time. So it's about moving from that equality concept to equity concept, which is something that some people don't get it. Some people don't get it, but it's crucial. I don't have anything um, hugely to add to what Elsie said. I, I, th I, think, I think I agree with that. It's probably more about um, equity. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in short to Nick's question, I think um, I, I do think we need to do things a bit more focused for certain groups of st students, people in the secondary school um, to encourage them maybe where they wouldn't be seeing either a career in healthcare or a career in pharmacy or anything as an option for them for whatever those reasons are. I think I think we're probably not as aware of those the reasons they don't proceed or do they don't follow a certain path and I, and I think that would be a helpful intervention maybe around what those 
what that looks like in a community or in a school or in, or in a university to, to, to be able to have those conversations, to understand what are those barriers and, and then a meaningful commitment or plan to start to address those, yeah. Thanks very much. That's, that's a really interesting question and a really interesting set of responses. And it, I welcome the question from HEE because obviously there's so much information out there and there's so much concern about making sure that there's an equitable process which starts at the very beginning. And as you quite rightly said, it's not at the point of joining the M-Farm. There's lots of factors prior to the M-Farm. In Reading University, for instance, they found that uh, students who uh, came in with a B-Tech qualification rather than A-levels had a lower standard of attainment. And a lot of students, a disproportionate students who came in with the BTEC were of main background. So we can't put it down to one simple thing. It's, it's a really complex issue. So that sometimes we can pick out really simplistic statistics, but there's a lot of underlying data which we need to think about. But I think the important thing which I get from the panel and probably from HEE is that I think everyone wants equity in the process, engagement in the process. And I think that's the, that's the best way forward. We've got time for one quick last question. Um, We've got two competing questions. Because you're part of the PDA union, I'm going to give it to the lady there who's, who's not. I'm also part of the PDA, but anyway. <laughs> good morning, everyone. I'm Dorothy. I just wanted to ask, and actually echo the words of Roger Klein, where he said, like, we, there are lots of action plans. A lot of companies have got action plans. So I just wanted to ask, like, in what ways can we do it? Or what ways in our individual workplace can we start to echo like practical applications of these action plans rather than just having action plans? Thank you. Okay, that's a really good question. We could spend quite a lot of time on it. But I'm going to give the panel about a minute each to, to uh, answer that question. Um, Dorothy, I think no more tick boxes. Like Roger Klein, you know, said in that article, it's about time of no um, saying that we are going to say, but doing what we need to do. So a start, if you have got an action plan, a start with your first action. Make sure that that is done. A start, you know, the process is going to be a slow, but we need to start. Um, it's no point putting an action plan, a date where it needs to be reached, the day arrive, and we have done absolutely nothing about it. So have the action plan, get your first action, get the team engaged, and do it. Deliver on it, and then you can move forward. Because, um, it is frustrating, this many, like I call, many paperwork and nothing is being done. No more tick boxes, I would say. Um, as, um, I think that I agree with that, what she said. I think it, we need to stop making it a tick box exercise. A lot of companies, uh, it says, well, it's one more thing got to do. Let's take it off and we've done it, that's it. It's not a tick box exercise. Racism and dealing with inequality. Um, it's not just something you do on a Monday morning and then put it on the back. It's something that's continuous. You have to live through it uh, to understand the impact it has on you. So um, what I would say to anyone, anyone in leadership position within a company is implement it with your heart and soul. Because one, it will make your uh, employees happier. It will make them feel like they're part of the family. It'll be good for your business because happy workers will be more willing to work and they'll, they will do a lot more to be in that place because most of us will. Right, okay, sorry. <laughs> you can't hear me, can you? Yeah, um, just very quickly. I, I think ultimately I completely agree with what you're saying and all I can draw on is experience from my own organization where we're quite early on in the journey and, and I've asked the whole team to hold everyone just hold each other to account on this one. So if everyone looks at me to be, oh, you're the chief pharmacist, fix EDI for us, uh, I ain't gonna do it. And I've been very clear with them that it will be the thing that keeps slipping. I said I was gonna do it six months ago, it slipped. It slipped, it slipped, it slipped. And I said to them, all, all right, here we go. You're all responsible for this as just as much as I am. I'm not the chief pharmacist in this group. I am just Rahul and you're all responsible. If you, if, you, if you come into my office all the time, tell me you're unhappy with the rotation you got, come into my office and also tell me you're unhappy with the way you see other things happening in the department. But if everybody doesn't all feel like they're responsible for it and don't hold each other to account, then I think you're right. It, always, it will always sit as an action plan and they'll all be waiting for someone else to do it because it's someone else's job. Um, so yeah, so I, so, I, so I think that's probably all I'd say. I think so everybody, leadership position or not, if you think you're in one or not, you've, got, you've all got a responsibility to fix this. Perfect. Thanks very much. I'm sorry to cut the panel short on, on this really uh, interesting topic. 
Thank you very much for everyone uh, who's attended today. And I think one of the things which I've taken from this session is that there's such a lot of goodwill and there's such a lot of interest in making sure that we create a profession which is inclusive and respects the diversity of every member of the profession. I think that's really important. And it's, it's so nice that people are, are engaging more and more and the, with these difficult conversations. And we know they can be really difficult. And one of the ways everyone can take part is being part of a network, whether it's the network which we, uh, the PDA, and I'm going to give a little bit of a plug to the PDA. We have four really good networks. Join the networks. Even if it's not the PDA, join a network because the network provides a support mechanism for you. It provides peer support, uh, someone to talk to, someone to discuss things with. And that's one of the things which has been shown to be lacking in, in, in a lot of candidates when they've been interviewed. What do you miss most, especially BAME candidates? It's that support network. Join the networks, whether it's the PDA or any other network, but I really urge you to join a network for your own support. Thanks very much. I hope you really enjoyed the CPC. And Paul is it's got some wonderful booklets. Please take the booklets with you. It's Insight Magazine. It gives you a flavor of what the PDA does in supporting pharmacists. Thank you very much for coming today.